Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. This segment is brought to you by Bull Realty for customized asset and occupancy solutions. Visit bullrealty.com. If you're looking to buy or sell office buildings, contact me personally. My email is michael at bullrealty.com. And speaking of office buildings, that's what we're going to talk about today. And it's one of the sectors in commercial real estate that seem to be most in question right now. Here we are at the end of January 2023, um, and it seems to be the, on, on everyone's mind. One of the things that uh, is happening around the country and around the, the world, in some cases, is converting office buildings to residential, to uh, multifamily uh, for sale or for rent. Uh, but what buildings and which buildings uh, work well for that? Is this, is this really happening? Uh, and what's some of the, the math behind it? Well, please welcome my guest. It's John Citra. He's co-founder of Citra Ruddy. They're an architectural firm headquartered in New York, and they've done a lot of uh, conversions of properties to different uses all, all over the world uh, for a long time. John Citra, thanks for joining us, sir. Uh, Michael, nice to meet you and uh, happy to be on the show. Well, thank you. And my first question is, you know, how many office properties are really being converted to multifamily uh, around the country because you know I th you know everybody hears about it and but, but is it really going on is what do you see well certainly my experience is mostly in the new york metro area but i do keep track on what's happening uh you know across the country uh west coast as well and chicago and you, what you're seeing is that uh it, it is a trend that actually started, you know, quite a few years ago now, uh, especially in the New York area with loft buildings being converted, artists coming in and moving into buildings, into uh, into these loft buildings and using them for studios, which then later became, you know, their residence. And uh, so there's there's a history of it that's been going on, but it has accelerated and a big part of our practice has always been uh, doing this kind of work. We've done more than 85 buildings in the New York in the New York area, uh, but what I'm reading about uh, what's happening in New York is is very similar to you know what what's happening across the country and of course it depends upon the the age of the you know the the office building stock uh, and uh, size of buildings very very important you know so it it is something that can happen in, in any metropolitan area that has that has a, a, you know, a dearth of, uh, of office buildings, uh, some of them more appropriate, some needing renovation uh, and upgrading and sort of you know, coming to those points and feeling uh, what's the next, what is the next step in the, you know, in the history of these buildings and what are their future, what is their future? So in any uh, city, uh, uh, American city across the country that has buildings like this, there's certainly a possibility for uh, conversions to occur, and uh, and we we see them we see them happening. Combined, some of them are mixed use. Uh, some of them are, would be partial conversion and uh, to residential, with some remaining uh, commercial space uh, there. But uh, it's definitely something which uh, I think it's a sign of the times as well. You know, we we want to make buildings that are more sustainable. We want to use buildings in a sustainable way. And why tear down every single building? Some of them are quite beautiful, and uh, and repurpose them. I think it's uh, it's something that is uh, is very very powerful in terms of the conversation about sustainability. And I'm sure you know we can we, we can touch on that as we, as we talk. So yeah, all around the country, you know, we're we're seeing it, and uh, certainly in New York City and the metro area, it is very very. Uh, prevalent. All right. And John, what makes a building more suitable for conversion to residential from office? One of the main things that makes a building most suitable is the size of the floor plate. You know, that is, uh, that's really critical. You know, uh, if you were going to design a new residential building, you would probably make a building where the lease span, which is the distance from the exterior wall to a corridor to a common 
uh, corridor would be about 30 feet, more or less. And and uh, if you look around the country, you'll see a lot of resident new residential buildings that are about 60, 65 feet in in width. Um, office buildings or these buildings that are were converted are usually much much deeper than that. So their lease spans are are you know could be uh, 40 to 50 feet, and so that creates uh, much more of a challenge in terms of creating buildings that are efficient. You know, the efficiency for uh, for residential buildings. And what I'm talking about efficiency is that getting the right size unit for the right uh, for the right rent. Uh, you know, this is something that we work with our clients really closely on, t- trying to get that get that formula you know to work. So. That is one of the most critical things when you look when we look at buildings. And I think that uh, the conversion sort of uh, process went has gone through a cycle where uh, many of the earlier buildings that we converted were were buildings actually from almost the turn of the century, some going far back as you know 1880, uh, taking loft buildings and converting those buildings. Some of them had floor plates which were not as deep as what happened. Uh, post World War II, with the construction of very large office buildings, where you know there would be over a million square feet uh, floor plates, could be almost you know 30,000 to 40,000 square feet, and and how to uh, how to how to subdivide those spaces and create you know usable uh, areas for residential is created a very different challenge than a lot of the buildings that we did earlier, where lease span was less, windows were closer, you know, you could stand in a floor and see um, daylight, um, you know, much, much more closely than in some of these very, very large office buildings that that came up in the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s. Yeah, so with these older buildings, then you had the advantages of smaller floor plates, and you probably also have the advantage of maybe more architectural style, it's uh, possible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. The, those buildings, some of those buildings are, are really beautiful. Uh, you know, we've done, <clears throat> you know, buildings from the 1920s uh, that were kind of the, some of the best Art Deco uh, office buildings uh, being built uh, around the country. Uh, prior to that, in the 1880s, the 1890s and 1920s, there were buildings that were either made of masonry or cast iron. And some of those buildings are just, you know, really beautiful, really beautiful buildings and with very large windows as well, high floor to floor heights, uh, you know, a lot of unique features that were very attractive. Yeah. And I, one thing about repurposing and adaptive reuse sometimes is the buildings already have a kind of a personality. They're already kind of known and you don't have to create that identity, right? What, what are some buildings that you've looked at and said, you know what, that, that your challenges are this and this, uh, this one won't work? Yeah, <clears throat> we've, had, we've actually had a few of those because we, when we started actually in the last 10 years, started looking at some of the larger post-war buildings that, you know, those buildings that were from the 1950s and 60s, uh, those buildings were, you know, designed for thousands of office workers coming in. They needed uh, they needed a lot of elevators to get people moving into those buildings. Uh, not uh, not very conducive, let's say, to like looking out the window. You see behind me here, and I'm in an, uh, one of these buildings from the 60s, which is actually quite a unique building because it's not that big. And <clears throat> so the windows are, are great. The windows are operable. Um, you know, which was very, very unusual. A lot of the buildings from uh, that were in this, built in the 60s, they were hermetically sealed uh, with uh, provided ventilation through mechanical systems. And so they have, they, those buildings have to be changed because in order to convert to a residential, you need to have operable windows. And so uh, sometimes the facades are not as easy to, uh, to modify. You know, to make the to make the windows uh, operable, um, but I think the number one issue that's most difficult is really is the size of the floor plate, and how deep is that floor plate, and can we can we either carve into it and, uh, from the outside or from the internally uh, to make it to make it work. And so 
really you have to the first thing is we looked at floor plates and uh there have been some buildings that you know over the years we've looked at uh, where tall buildings too could be 30 40 stories uh where the floor plates were just too big and there was just too much internal area that we could not make work for residential you know some people have thought well maybe buildings could be mixed there could be the core interior court could be used for for other uses you know technology related uses uh someone even recommended at one point a cannabis farm in the middle of the you know of a building but uh, none of those really are you know viable i mean good ideas and we should continue to think about other options for those spaces but uh, the building, in, I think, in order to uh, make money and make sense for a residential developer, has to work as much as possible for a residential conversion. So that's the first thing. I mean, we can take elevators out of buildings. You, you know, you don't need as many elevators in a residential building uh, of the same size versus a commercial building. So we can we can reconfigure the core. Uh, we can make them much more energy efficient, changing the mechanical systems because those systems, even though they might have been upgraded over the years, they're still kind of antiquated systems. Uh, and, and so that that's a big you know, improvement, but it's everything comes down to, well, can I can I actually utilize the space? And if I can't utilize it, can I can I even can I cut it out? Can I take it out and put it on top? You know, which we've done, which we are doing. And but that's costly. Uh, and so that would affect I guess the you know the price that a developer would pay for a building like that, uh, but sometimes it works and sometimes it wouldn't. So so each case we have to look at individually. But those are the key things like how many elevators can do we need to take out? How much reconfiguration of the core? How much modification to the facade is going to be necessary? And and uh, can the structure withstand the addition of floor area being built on top of it? And that's, I think that's an interesting conversation because uh, a lot of buildings from this period, from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, were designed under very different seismic requirements. And so adding on top of the building, which inc increases, let's say, it's, uh, you know, it's a, the impact of wind on a building, uh, they may not be designed and most likely were not designed for that. So it's not that feasible to put floor area on top of existing buildings without making modifications to structure. And so some developers would turn away from that, those kind of buildings and say, it's just not worth it because it's going to be too much, too expensive to, uh, to make that kind of modification, but we are doing it. We are doing that. We are adding on top where we're, we're, you know, bolstering structure, uh, in some of those projects in order to make it work. Yeah cannabis uh, farm in the middle of a building. So I guess we could name that building. I'll go ahead and name that one the high building. <laughs> um, we're talking with John Citra, uh, architectural planning firm uh, based in uh, New York. Uh, and we're talking about converting office properties uh, to residential. And, and John, what do you what are developers seeing uh, on average for uh, cost uh, comparison of building a new multifamily building versus converting a, an office property? Well, I think in the New York area right now, people are talking about from three fifty three hundred fifty dollars to $500 a square foot for a new residential building. Of course, there might be some cases where there's above that and some cases below it, depending upon, the, depending upon where it is. So, uh, that would be for a new built new structure. The thing is that with uh, if you're taking a building uh, conversion where you know the facade is in good shape, but you're probably going to change the you're, you're probably going to change the windows, uh, you upgrade the windows, change the mechanical systems. You do have the structure there already, obviously, uh, and so that's a that's a that's a big cost savings. And you know it's it's construction cost. So that you know because you have the building. And if the facade is in good shape, that will bring some of the costs down. But I think what's even more important is the fact that you can get into the building and start occupying it quicker. You're not digging foundations, which in New York, you know, a, a usual usually would take nine months uh, or more to just get to the ground floor of a new building. 
uh, under construction. So you've, you're saving a lot of time. And right now, uh, a, lot of, a lot of my clients are concerned about the impact of interest rates. And so these buildings, if they're sitting there, if it's just a hole in the ground, there's, no, there's obviously no money coming in in a new construction project. Uh, the, the major benefit, one of the major benefits is that you can get that building occupied, an existing building you can get occupied quicker. And so that will, you know, your, your, your construction cost might be a little less, maybe slightly below $300 a foot, but you're also saving, I think, uh, tremendously on the oper- on the carrying costs. You know, you're, you're, right. you're getting occupied sooner. Right. That time they, savings they, 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 to, um, yeah, that time saving know, to get to delivery and be real important. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it could be maybe 18 months or two years versus three years. Right. you know, for, for a new building. So, right. uh, you know, by the time you design it and get it approved and go through uh, construction, it's, it could be three years for a developer right. or more. Right. And what are you seeing for entitlements and, and zoning uh, municipalities? Uh, uh, how are, are you, what's your experience there for that conversion? So that's really interesting because, uh, New York City zoning, which many people talk about and, uh, you know, uh, curse it, actually, because it's so complex, it is actually something which we feel that we are very comfortable with. We know the we know the regulations. It's three huge, you know, bound volumes, legal size volume uh, that, that covers all aspects of land use, bulk controls uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's really kind of an ex- exceptional uh, document because uh, you can go into a building and know pretty much what you can do as of right, you know, which, you know, people call, call what are the entitlements? Uh, you know what they are and you know what you have to do to convert the building or build a building. And unless you're willing to go outside of those regulations, you can you can work through entitlements pretty easily pretty quickly you know you can file you file plans <clears throat> with the building department they have, that covers zoning there's no separate land use review it's all done within the jurisdiction of the building department as i said if you wanted to do something that was outside of what's allowed in those three volumes then you're kind of on your own because you're you're going through a process uh, a land use review process, uh, community board review, uh, political reviews, uh, that will take much, much longer. And that probably would take two years at least uh, to go through that. So in New York, the entitlements are you know, very easy to work through, I, comparatively speaking. Of course, there's, you know, there are issues that you have to work out uh, and limitations that you have to work around but at least uh, I think for, from a developer standpoint, th- you know what you're getting into. You know, so if you can live with that, you can live with the amount of floor area that's available for conversion, uh, and you can comply with all the other uh, regulations. You're you're good. You're you're good to go. So what's interesting is so New York New York City and New York State developed a series of guidelines for development, both in the what's called the multiple dwelling laws of the state of New York and also within the zoning resolution of the city of New York, which said that buildings that were built uh, prior to 1961 could be converted to residential use. And then they relaxed certain bulk regulations, yard requirements, uh, even floor area. In, in New York and New York State, New York City and New York State, residential development on any site is maxed out at 12 FAR. Sometimes it's less, but that's the maximum, 12 FAR. And so uh, what's now come to pass is with some of these really larger buildings that were built in the the 70s and 80s, where it's not uncommon for them to be over a million square feet, that where the FAR could be 15 or 18 or even up to 21 in, uh, in certain districts, there is a limitation in terms of how much residential could be converted there because the max, the, the cap was 12. So actually just this week, the mayor of New York uh, uh, and, a, and a task force that uh, he put together called the Office Adaptive Reuse Task Force 
uh, wrote a series of recommendations for how the regulations could change. And they did uh, three kind of two or three major things that they that they said there. They said, first of all, we're going to increase the number of years. So any building built prior to 1991 could be converted, which is that's great. That was great news. And that it could be in more districts than what was previously allowed uh, before uh, the financial district was one that got actually uh, that we see, we're seeing a lot of conversion happening in buildings prior to 1977 because they allowed conversion for buildings up to 1977. So they changed it there because they wanted to bring more, create a more mixed use environment. Um, and, and there were many more, many newer buildings downtown that uh, would not be, you wouldn't be able to convert because of the 61 cut, cutoff date. So that was really good news. And the other thing that is in the, in the zoning resolution is that no matter how large, how much floor area is in those buildings, it could be 100% converted to residential. So the 12 FAR cap uh, was not was not applicable to uh, to those buildings in those districts. So they said, so some of the recommendations that they're now talking about is that uh, to get rid of the 12 FAR cap and allow for more buildings in these other districts to be fully uh, renovated, fully converted. So I think that's going to that's going to spur a lot more development because some of the buildings maybe just wouldn't work with, uh, you know, converting, you know, maybe like uh, three quarters of the building for residential and, and maintaining a quarter for uh, commercial or office use. So there's uh, I think we're going to see many more of these larger buildings and I can say that's for sure going to happen. It's already uh, those some of those buildings are already being uh, thought about for conversion. So we're going to see that. So I mean, those were those were really critical things that were holding back on uh, on the conversion, uh, potentially holding back on, on conversion, because some of the buildings that were after 1977 would be great for conversion. So uh, so now there'll be there'll be more. Uh, uh, availability, you know, and in, in New York City, uh, there's 600 million square feet of office space. And so which is like, uh, according to the mayor's report, task force report is is more than, you know, Chicago and Los Angeles put together. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential here for, uh, for these conversions to happen. And, and once these, these uh, recommendations get enacted, which would Hopefully, can can happen fairly quickly. Uh, we're going to see we're going to see even more buildings being uh, being converted. Yeah, it sounds like municipalities are kind of encouraging. All right, we need more housing. Um, yeah. What about are your developers that are doing these conversions? I assume most of these developers probably have done uh, ground up uh, construction of apartments, and some of these apartments are a little bit cookie cutter uh, and maybe don't have the uniqueness that a conversion will find. Are, are your developers um, anticipating or seeing uh, a little higher rents per square foot for converted buildings than they are on maybe the cookie cutter new construction? Oh, yes, for sure. You know, when on the rental market, uh, that's certainly the case. I mean, <clears throat> you do have to be more creative with the layouts, uh, you know, on some of these buildings because your, your, your apartments are deeper. And so you have to incorporate home offices and you know uh, and other kinds of spaces that will allow for some flexibility in the layout so <clears throat> so those buildings I you know that's one of the things I really love about uh, working on conversions is that there are there's so much possibility you know potential to create apartments that are far from cookie cutter you know uh, you do. You have the struggle of square footage because you want to, you know, you want to make a one-bedroom apartment. In the New York market, a one-bedroom can range from 550 to 600, 625 square feet. And so, you know, when you stretch an apartment out, you have to realize, you know, you're picking up more square footage in depth. So that means it gets narrower. Uh, and, and so you have to be uh, creative with the layouts and creating spaces like home offices or alcoves that can be used. In a number of different of different ways. So uh, uh, that's one thing. Secondly, office buildings were always built at a higher floor-to-floor -floor height standard than residential. 
So you're getting you're getting uh, spaces that have more variety and height. And so those are, you know, those are those are major uh, aspects that I think makes them really uh, desirable. And uh, and then, you know, you also uh, if you can create an apartment where there's more flexibility into it, maybe somebody, maybe two people would share an apartment, you know, so that would help uh, them carry the rent. But it also might mean if a developer knows that some of these apartments will be shared that that would have an impact on on the rental price per foot. So, uh, you know, it, there's there's a great there's a great uh, amount of creativity that uh, that we're that we're incorporating into these buildings. And, you know, the other thing that's happened is that uh, and we've seen this now for almost 20 years um, that buildings, residential buildings started providing really kind of rich um, uh, amenity packages, right? So it was at one point, you know, if you a developer could take a two bedroom apartment on the ground floor and convert it into a little gym and it wasn't very exciting, just the, you know, kind of one little space. Uh, the amenities have gotten to really kind of great, you know, s- standards. I mean, we're doing so much more creating, you know, uh, places for people to work, lounge spaces, uh, different kinds of recreation activities, uh, pools, you know, uh, basketball courts, you know, uh, outdoor terraces where there can be uh, barbecues and things like that. So there's all of this now that's coming into these larger residential buildings that are uh, really creating, uh, you know, vertical communities. It's it's just it's not just you're renting an apartment. I, in some cases, I, I feel like we're we're creating a club and you get an apartment for free once you get, <laughs> once you pay the membership fee. So uh, it, it's, they're, they're really rich and they're, and uh, you know, and we're, we're challenging and we love this challenge of creating spaces that are, that are unique, uh, that uh, people will, you know, be proud of, you know, that uh, it becomes those spaces, amenities become an extension of the community. So, you know, get to know people, uh, you get like-minded people that are living in the building who who enjoy uh, maybe uh, uh, some of the spaces to where there could be you know uh, uh, recording studios uh, or or uh, craft spaces or you know different kinds of hangout spaces or workspaces or a beautiful pool on the top of the building. You know, there's just there's uh, there's a lot to, that can be offered with uh, with these buildings. So uh, we're seeing them now. You know, really being very, very important aspect of the whole package, not just an apartment. Yeah, that is really awesome to think about those yeah. different types of amenities and, and the uniqueness that you could design in these properties where, you know, people are renting or, or buying an apartment and, and it's just unique. There, there's nothing else uh, like it and, and potentially no other buildings like it. Um, John, I assume that most of these conversions to multifamily from office have separate HVAC systems for each unit. Uh, is that the case? Or are you seeing some that still can use the central uh, systems the office buildings have? No, we're we're taking out all of those central systems on every single project, going to VRF systems or heat pump systems that will give individual control to the tenant in the building. It's the same, the same as any other residential building where you would provide that. Uh, there is some mechanical ventilation as, that's provided into uh, the apartment because of the depth, you know. So if you're 35, 40 feet away from the exterior uh, wall of the building, you know, you're going to have, uh, uh, you, you need to provide additional ventilation in, those, in that area that's within the, you know, within that depth in those, those spaces in the back. So, um, you know, the... Uh, and you can't do that with the systems that are there. You know, yeah. a lot of these systems were forced air systems with huge uh, air handlers at the top of the building, ducts going down. I mean, they took a lot of space as well. So we just we take away all of that, yeah. all of those uh, systems. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, and use that area for other things. And one of our projects is 20 Broad Street had which was a building that was built as an extension to the New York Stock Exchange. You know, there was a huge air handler at the top of the building with huge ducts running through the building. We ripped all of that out. We created an amenity space and two floors, additional floors of residential within the same volume. Wow. So, you know, it's very possible to uh, 
to sorry about that to 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 make things work uh, in in really unique and creative ways yeah well, jo- well john as we um end the um uh, show here what would you leave our audience with to think about related to converting office to uh residential well i would say that you know there's there, there's there's great potential uh, as I was been, you know, talking about uh, in buildings that are also um, not as old as one would think. You know, there's buildings from the 80s and 90s that now can be considered, you know, for for a residential conversion, and that um, and I think that uh, it's a great time to you know explore that. And and uh, from a policy standpoint, because I'm I'm also very interested in urban planning and city planning you know there are the almost all of the residential conversion projects were creating market rate units and uh it's going to be a challenge to uh as 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 time goes on and uh and there's going to be more and more of these buildings available is there some mechanism to create you know more affordable uh apartments within these within these buildings and we'll see how that goes. Uh, I don't. I, we don't have an answer for that uh, because there are not the same kind of tax uh, incentives that are there to build new buildings, where uh, you know you provide a, a 25 to 30 percent affordable units, you get a, you get tax breaks. And uh, I think that if we want to see a more equitable distribution of of housing typologies in these conversions, then uh, that kind of uh, that kind of policy is going to need to be extended to uh, conversions as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, and with the kind of the new shared environment where uh, a lot of people are more comfortable sharing, um, like co living. And uh, last right. night I, I had dinner with my 25 year old uh, daughter, and she's wearing a, a j- new jacket. And she's and I said, well, when'd you get that? She said, well, I don't own it. I, I, I it's it, I get new ones each uh, week, and they're shared uh, in this community. Uh-huh. So I don't know uh, yeah. if setting up some of these office buildings as kind of co living, where they have central, more central bathrooms, and I don't know if any, anybody thought about uh, doing something like that, where you're renting kind of smaller yeah. units and have shared maybe kitchens or shared bathrooms in some cases. Yeah, well, we actually we are there. We are doing a project now in uh, in uh, Queens County, and uh, which is a uh, five hundred thousand square foot uh, new building. But a portion of the building will have co living units. So uh, and they're designed differently, you know, a little bit differently. So uh, it's designed with that in mind, right? That people are going to there's going to be two bedrooms there, two baths, and a small kitchen. Uh, and that it's, uh, but it's, it's, it feels different, uh, a little bit. And, uh, in addition to the apartment is there's that club, you know, aspect of it. it's got a great amenity space as well. That's going to be, uh, available for those, uh, for those residents. So yeah, co-living I think is, is very popular, especially in cities like New York, where the rent is very, is, 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 is high for some people and they can't. They can't uh, they can't afford to rent a studio apartment by themselves, so they're looking for the best kind of share, what's convenient to you know mass transit, plus great amenities, maybe a park nearby or something. So that's going to be you know, that we see that happening. Yeah, that's going to be important. Because, uh, well, good. Well, 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 John, if they like- maybe, maybe even for even for uh, you know the elderly, you know, like creating. Uh, housing for the elderly that would also be, uh, you know, kind of fit into these buildings. So yeah, it's endless. There's no reason why there shouldn't be one type of housing that should be eliminated or not available in a conversion. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Well, John, thank you for joining us. Great information, sir. Okay, Michael, good to see you. Take care. And if you like more information from John about this, uh, we'll have his uh, connections to his email, phone number, his website at CREshow.com or reach out to me directly, Michael at BullRealty.com. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing the show. Please let us know what you think and uh, reach out to us at any time. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show.
Appreciate the show? Consider referring business or doing business with our sponsors. Bull Realty is a commercial real estate sales, leasing, and advisory firm doing business throughout the Southeast, headquartered in Atlanta. Visit bullrealty.com for more information. Commercial Agent Success Strategies provides video training for commercial agents. This training gets five-star reviews from even the most experienced brokers. Learn more at commercialagentsuccess.com. You're invited to connect with us on your favorite social media. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Don't miss a show of special interest to you. Be sure and subscribe to the show on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. And at the show website, CREshow.com, you can subscribe for a weekly email announcing the show topic and guest. While you're there, you also found more videos and podcasts. Thank you for watching or listening to America's Commercial Real Estate Show.